Welcome to part two of this three-part series, speaking with Coach Bill Tierney. Before Coach lets us in on the secret to maintaining and sustaining a great coaching career, please don't forget to click like and subscribe so you don't miss any episode of Sportlight Sport Report. I may have told you this story before, but a couple of years ago, we had a young man come to me and say, I, uh, you know, can we play music while we, while we stretch today? And I said, you know, I've been coaching 30 something years. I don't, I don't think so. And he said, Oh, come on coach, please. And he was one of my favorite kids. He wasn't a great player, but he was one of the favorite all time teammates I've ever coached. So I said, all right, Grant, we'll give it a shot. So he came, they came out of the locker room that day and he told the whole team, he was so excited that he talked me into this and uh, came out with this, this little thing that I, I started laughing. I said, is that your speaker? You know, like, go ahead, blast it. You know, little did I know that the thing could rock all the way to Wash Park and back, you know? And so all of a sudden the music goes on and the kids are stretching and in my mind, it is not music. It is total noise and it is loud. And, and finally I said, no, Lord, turn it off, turn it off. So he turns it off and I thought it was over. The next day he comes back in my office. I said, what are you doing here? And he goes, can we give it one more try? And I said, I don't know, Grant, that was pretty bad. He goes, no, we'll make the music better. I promise, I promise. I said, okay, we'll give it one more try. One stipulation is I get a song, you get a song, I get a song, you get a song. So he said, okay, that sounds fair. So we recorded, uh, what do they call it? A playlist, I guess is what they call it now. And uh, so I gave him my songs and he was the only one who knew this. So he takes it out there and their first, so I said, the first one when they're stretching was their song. And it was better than the day before, clearly, but not something I'd listen to it at night at home alone, that's for sure. Um, and it was loud and it was quick and a lot of boinging around and stuff. But the next song was my song and it was Hey Jude by the Beatles. And it was seven minutes of just the most droll kind of slow tempo music. We got about halfway through and the, one of the other captains stood up. He said, no more coach, no more music. I said, okay. And, and I, you know, I kind of chuckled, but I got my way. <laughs> you know, that was the way it was. So I think, I think just letting them know nowadays that you love them. We use the word love around here a lot. We, we hug them, we kick them. You know, when the last, the last thing I say to any, any young man's um, parents before he commits to come into Denver and we commit a spot to him is uh, I need your the permission from your parents to do two things. Number one is kick you in the butt when you need it. And number two is give you a hug when you need it. And every kid needs both. And they need to, you need to just make eye contact each day or, or if you miss one or two, we, you know, every day, cause we have a big team, you know, just make sure you pat them on the back. Those little touches mean so much to them and, and just tell them that it's okay once in a while uh, that they made a mistake. And uh, um, I had a kid the other day, a really good player for us. He was just playing terribly the other day and he was getting angry with himself. And I, I, I you know, I, I said to him, I said, listen, there's nothing you can do about those two things. You, you were really bad doing those two things. But if you pound your stick on the ground and you get all upset, you'll never do a good one. I said, try to think about succeeding in the next one. And I've never, you know, I, I don't do that a lot. But uh, and luckily for me, the other kids heard it. And he took a shot and nailed it, put it right in the top corner of the net. He kind of looks at me and, you know, I, you know, I kind of, I kind of give him the old saying, "Oh, yeah, see, the old guy still knows a, a few things, you know." And and so they kind of, whenever you can get a little bit of a smile out of these guys, you know, you, you've you've meant something to them that day. So I try all those little things and 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 keep adaptive uh, and flexible as how we go about our business. I think that's what's allowed me to kind of stay somewhat successful in the game. When you were in college, you probably didn't have a sports psychology class. No. <laughs> I mean, what you just talked about, too, in terms of attentional focus and shifting somebody from, hey, you can't control the past, control the future, control your attitude and refocus and just go do it again. I mean, it's easier said than done, but that's one of the typical things that we teach nowadays in a sports psych mental skills class. Yeah, the sports psychology back then in that situation was, hey, quit being a crybaby. If you don't like it, get the hell out of here. You know, yes. and then and that was it. Or your teammates would say, what, what's wrong with you? You know, and uh, so, it, yeah, it was it was psychology, but I'm not sure how uh, 
I'm not sure it didn't damage a few uh, brain cells up here back then. Yeah. Well, I mean, right. And I, I coached football and played college football. And you get a coach that starts yelling at you to, you know, to focus, focus. Or okay. you just do it again, do it again. And you're, something is obviously not working. Right. And, you know, having the coach just yell at you and say something, they're like, hey, this is not, I'm, I'm trying to learn, but obviously we're stuck in this mindset where it's not effective. Right, right. Yeah, what's the saying now uh, uh, about uh, repeating the same mistake over and over again is not improvement? That, you know, that's for sure. Try to solve the problem the same way over and over again. Exactly. You know, you're, you're crazy or something. Like, we're not, I'm not saying it right either, but it's the definition of insanity. Yeah. I always yeah. found it um, funny when my coaches would say, well, you, you got to pay attention. It's like, oh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. If only I thought of that. <laughs> it's, it's great stuff. Us, us coaches, we have some beautiful things that we say, you know. And my hope is that, uh, you know, I had a, uh, had uh, you know, a, a course, a stunts and tumbling course in college, and there was a 72-year-old professor, Prof Holloway, and that was during the Vietnam time. And it, I see the Vietnam time as kids were very similar to they are now. They were a little more angry back then because they were worried about getting drafted and going, going to Vietnam. But they were also very inquisitive, like they like they are now. And uh, we would you had to pass this course. You had to do a standing back flip and a running front flip. And uh, one of the guys, you know, is a real wise guy. Goes, hey, prof, what do we, you know, what does it matter if we can do it as long as we, you know, the the kids do it in the class? And he goes, I'll show you, young man. And he takes off his whistle, takes off his hat, hands him to me. I happen to be sitting, standing next to him. He backs up and takes a run and 72 years old, does a running front flip, lands square on his feet. And he goes, so you can be a good teacher, you know? And then and it was just so impactful, you know, like, all right, this is what we're in for. This isn't just uh, jumping jacks, you know? And it was, it was pretty cool. It was a great moment. And when's the last time you've done that after a big win or? <laughs> <laughs> now those days, uh, it, it is funny though, when I was teaching, uh, you know, I got this public school teaching job and the, 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 the boys phys ed teacher who was there before me loved gymnastics, but he had like a 12 week, you know, program of gymnastics and the kids got, you know, it got tiresome. And, and so I invented things like, uh, you know, we do leave the gymnastics equipment up, not for 12 weeks, more like for three weeks, but we do, uh, you know, um, obstacle courses and, 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 you know, stunts and tumbling type tricks and stuff. So, uh, you know, I remember one, one guy I had a, I had a show, it wasn't quite a running front flip, but I could do a, I could do a running, um, a front handspring back then. And that, that, that kind of settled them in pretty well. But then again, I was only like 26 years old back then, not 72. I did my, uh, in my senior year of high school, I did a senior project where I coached or I taught middle school phys ed. I was the helper to our phys ed teacher in middle school. <laughs> and he would, he would absolutely demolish everybody in ping pong. There were, there were two ping pong courts set up always, always in the back of the gym. Right. And he would just demolish you. And then in high school, I had, I remember Mr. Dunlap, Mr. Dunlap would demolish everybody in badminton. He could, he could place a birdie wherever he wanted to on the court. Uh, and then actually too, in grad school, I had, uh, we had a world champion badminton uh, was the director of the phys ed program at Tennessee. Right. And, and you would play badminton. And we're all in our 20s and we're all great, you know, athletes. And it, this guy's, you know, 55 or so. And every shot was a kill shot. And he, he would just make you run around the entire <laughs> room. And he was like, oh, he's just totally playing with you. But, you know, you had so much kind of respect and like regard for like these guys that were just insane you know right, right. And, and and they're 20 20 30 years older than you and you're just getting smashed yeah i know and it's the same in coaching i remember my first high school football game we're playing a cross town rival and we're walking off the field at halftime and my two coaches who i've alluded to a bunch um i was walking behind them and we were losing um seven to six at the time and i remember hearing the head coach look at the other coach going we got this thing and i'm like whoa you know this is our first game we were supposed to be great this year we're already losing to the crosstown rival and you know we went in at halftime and made some adjustments I, I don't remember what we did but we came out and we 
we ended up winning the game 40 to 21. And I, and, and it stuck in my head, the impact that he had, he was so confident and, and, and the changes he made. Um, and it's just like that, you know, you gain res such respect for these people. And then I got to coach with them and then replace them later on, which of course was, was pretty cool. A, an athlete that you really wanted to reach, but just were, were not able to do it. Sure. I, you know, there, there are, and there are, there are, you know, failures in our profession. Our profession is one where um, people look at scoreboard, unfortunately, and, and there are plenty of coaches that are great coaches who have been fired because the scoreboard hasn't worked for them. You know, they've lost a lot of games, um, but maybe nobody knew about the success stories they had with individual young men, getting them from maybe a rough home life or maybe, uh, maybe help them with their studies or whatever it might be, or, you know, uh, all the different trials and tribulations you go with 18 to 22 year olds. And, and it's, it's the opposite. I I've been blessed to, to have been a part of a lot of winning teams and all that stuff. But it's, I think when you, it's just like when you win and, and lose some, the losses feel greater emotionally than the wins do when you look back on them. But, and it's the same when you lose, when you lose one, um, you know, I'm very proud of the fact that I've never cut in all these years. I've never cut a young man that I've recruited unless unless they've screwed around with alcohol or drugs or just didn't do well in school, you know, you know, or misbehave socially, obviously. And and even those guys that, that have been in quote, uh, you know, in quotes, pretty easy to throw off the team because they you know, it takes a lot, you know, and uh, um, to be honest, you still hurt by it because you feel like you've let them down, the family down. Uh, we, we, we take kids in now that we know, and I have to go to admissions and say, this is a little bit of a challenge. This is gonna be one we're gonna all have to keep our eye on, whether it be academically, or maybe he's had some you know, family issues or whatever, but um, what supersedes those ones you've lost are those ones that you've been successful with that have been the risks. You know, we had a young man here at Denver, Jeremy Noble, who was what, my first year here. I had to go over to Tom Willoughby, who was the admissions director back then, and begged Tom to let Jeremy in. And, and he said, Bill, I, I just don't know. It's not that I don't like the kid. He's a good kid, but I, I don't know if he'll make it here. And I said, Tom, we'll take care of him. I promise you we'll take care of him. And, and we did. And then all of a sudden it clicked for Jeremy and uh, graduated with a 3-3, one of our best players ever, one of our best captains and leaders ever. And those kind of stories make you, you don't forget the failures, but at least make you say to yourself, see, I, we can still do this, you know, on that side as well. And, and you take great pride in that. And, and the ones that have those rough home lives, the, you know, we've had so many crazy situations, not just here at Denver, but all, in all my coaching career from, you know, divorces and deaths and families and all that stuff. And uh, um, when you when you sit down with them and, and they understand that you can take that coach's hat off, you know, that football coach who told you what to do every play, uh, that you can be, um, you can have, that you do have feelings and you're with them and you call them up. I just had a young man, I had a call, I called 15 minutes before we got on because he, you know, he, he's had to go see a doctor for something pretty serious. And you know, he couldn't thank me enough for the phone call, you know, and that to me, that's, that's what you should do. But to him and his family, that was just above and beyond. And that's, you have to do that stuff. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering now, as you, as you brought it up to the, you know, and I can't take off my faculty professor hat, you know, what do you think of the ethics of uh, college admissions and the interaction with sports and athletics that, that, you know, at times, and you tend not to at least hear about them as much with lacrosse, but you see a lot with football or basketball, you know, that they're getting unqualified kids in school and that they really, and then they put them in a sham class. You know, it, it, it's a, it's a sticky situation. And we talk about it in class, you know, what are you going to do about it? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's a dilemma certainly because, you know, as a coach, as I said, we're all, we're all measured by the wins and losses. And, and we all think that, uh, every 17 year old is going to save our careers. And we, what we realize very quickly, whether you're uh, teaching about this stuff as you guys do, or you, or they're on the field, um, you're going to have failures and going to have successes. 
Um, it's interesting now with recruiting, people often ask me about recruiting now with the pandemic. I actually think we're getting to know the kids even better now through the Zoom calls and, and because they can't come to campus and, and come into your office and show them around. But I do think overall, when, it, when the coaches start realizing, uh, and this is why I might, have, I might have people who disagree with me, but this is why I'm against paying student athletes, because I, I look at their value, the value they get, especially these kids that get full scholarships, which are none in lacrosse, basically. Um, everybody forgets they're getting an education. Now, I think if you go back, and that's a free education, which in, in a lot of places, as we know dearly, that's worth you know $300,000 over four years. Um, now, we also know that some of, those, some of those kids are taking those courses where they're basically, the tutor's taking their tests for them or the courses, they get an A for spelling their name right or, or showing up or, uh, and all that stuff. And I, I understand paying that young man because he's basically, he's not, lear he's not learning enough to have a degree that, that means anything when he, when he gets out. It's just like use him, spit him out and on with the next guy. So I think there's a huge uh, gap in that. I'm thankful that I uh, um, eventually ended up in the lacrosse coaching world because I think for the most part, even though we have, you know, two great pro leagues now, we're talking about guys that might make 30,000 a year in a pro league for two or three years and then realize that his college education is going to, you know, give him the rest of his life. Um, but we're not talking about guys who are going to be making millions, you know, even, even here where some of our hockey players, you know, do sign those big contracts. That's far and few between. And those kids, those guys learn uh, from David Carl and his staff, a lot of great lessons in life and, and learn how to get that degree. And uh, so it's, it, it's a dilemma. And that's why we have to stress as coaches at places like DU and all the colleges uh, that for the most part are, are looking in the right direction that guys, you know, you got to get your degree first. This is the most important part. When I'm in recruiting, I often give recruits the hint to um, when they're in another coach's office or on a Zoom call now with another coach, even if you're not even interested, tell the coach you want to be a doctor or you want to be an engineer and watch his eyes. And I tell the parents this, watch his eyes. And when his head goes down or his eyes roll back or he kind of rubs his face and says, you know, that's awful difficult. Don't go play there because that means that he is not willing to go along your journey, your academic journey, which if we're even half caring as coaches, we know that that's the most important thing they're getting out of, out of college. Yeah, they'll learn some lessons from us through the years. They'll learn from their teammates through the years. They'll have some downs, they'll have some ups, but ultimately without that, meaningful degree, then, um, then they're wasting their time. And if a coach doesn't want, allow a kid to be a doctor or an engineer or, you know, or at high business end school or something like that, um, then, then he always he cares about him as being a good lacrosse player. And that, that's pretty shallow. Yeah. And, and just to clarify for anybody that's going to be listening, right. Cause there are college coaches or the, you know, they put it off on an academic counselor that will track athletes into the so-called easy majors. And, and the coaches often discourage a challenging major because they feel it'll take them away, take the athletes away from investing all of their time and energy into the sport. Especially the sciences, you know, you have all those extra labs and it, it gets hard with uh, scheduling, but. Yeah, no question. And I, and I think it's the recognition of the coach to say, you know, in our sport, in a football, you know, it's if you don't recognize that five days a week of practice for one game a week it can be pretty mundane. And that if a kid is going to organic chemistry lab and God forbid shows up late to your practice by a half hour for two of those days a week, uh, it, everything's going to be OK. Because usually those are the kids. And I always say this. The kids who are taking the hardest stuff or even the kids who work hardest in, in, in areas, you know, um, in other areas. I mean, we have here at Denver, you guys know this, we have this great construction management major. Those guys work hard, hard. And, and yet, so anybody that'll work hard in their academic major, 
They never get in trouble. They always give you everything they've got on the field and they care so much about their teammates. It's the ones that, they kind of skate off and just, oh, I'll get my degree in, in a meaningless major. I just want to play. Those are the guys that cause you the problems because they, they got too much time on their hands and what they're doing here doesn't, uh, isn't as meaningful as it is for those guys that are taking the, the tougher courses. Are you, are you saying it's biz ed majors like us that are the problems? No, because I think I know how hard I had to work, you know, so, and, and I think it's along that same line as that construction management guy is that I think a lot of, if you look at phys ed majors, um, they're one of the rare group that kind of has an idea at 17, 18 years old, what they want to do. Whereas a lot of kids will say, I'll say to them, well, what, what are you thinking about? And they'll say, I'm not sure, maybe business, maybe science, maybe, you know, and, they have no idea. And, and, and so I do think the kids who have so, a little more focus are the ones that, whether, no matter what the major, are the ones that, that are going to be going through their academics pretty well. Yeah. I, think, I, I mean, the, the phys ed majors, especially if you're going into coaching and you kind of have that mindset and you're like, I really want to pursue this and I, and I love coaching and sports and being around people and I don't want that desk job. You know, that's the... That's <laughs> exactly. The, those are the ones that are really kind of locked in. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we do a thing here at Denver. We uh, it drives our strength coaches a little crazy because it's, it's outside the realm of, of the new regimes of, of conditioning and stuff. But every Monday we do a Monday mile and I've been doing that with my college teams for almost 40 years. And honestly, it's probably, probably doesn't help them any because it's Monday after a Saturday night and whatever, but I know it gets some bad stuff out of their system and, 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 and it's a challenge for them. And, and um, you know, and, and so when we, when we do that, we know that uh, it's, it's, it's hard. We know that it's, uh, it's kind of outside the realm of, of reality, but we also know that, that they, um, they have a, I tell my players that you're not going to believe this, but if you're a senior and it's Monday, Next, one year from now, when you're sitting in that cubicle in New York City or San Francisco or downtown Denver, you're going to wish you could run a Monday mile. And so, you know, it's, uh, you're right. I mean, it, it is what it is. Especially during COVID. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I can't wait to get outside. <laughs> right. They, they're running virtual miles now. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. No need to wait. Part three of this great interview with Coach Tierney is just a click away. Don't miss Coach talking about how his team won the national championship with not one, but two of his sons on the team. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and click on the bell so you don't miss any episode of Sportlight Sport Report.